Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to Wednesday night's uh, verse by verse, chapter by chapter Bible study here at Calvary. Um, let's start with a prayer. So, Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for tonight. That, you know, okay, outside here is a little dark, dreary, but we know when we study your word, it's light and it shines in our hearts, in our mind, and there's joy in studying your word. So, Lord, be with us. I just pray that you continue to guide each one's life as they study the Bible here uh, in Job. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, we're in Job chapter 8, but as you know, Job is a very, uh, it's an interesting story. It's an interesting book where a man who had everything, um, he had family, he had um, wealth, he had good health, but it was all taken away from him. And we know it was because we see from the Word of God that we have a heavenly scene where, you know, God had a um, uh, agreement or allowed Satan to take away uh, Job's family, all his ten children, uh, take his uh, wealth, everything, and then take his health. So, if you think about it, when you lose everything in life, let's just say um, when something big happened and you know that your your health is not doing well and you're gonna, there's a date and the doctor's already told you, or something happened to your family. You know, a lot of things, um, we're busy with a lot of things in life, but when we know that our health is bad or there's an expiration date around the corner, we don't worry about the things we worry about now. Uh, we don't think about, you know, should we... Um, uh, do that extra project or take that extra job or do this, do that. All the things we're thinking about now, not so important when you know um, you have that issue. I remember when my um, first wife uh, of, 30, of almost 30 years, uh, when she passed away, nothing um, I mean, I used to do a lot of different things, uh, get, got involved with a lot of different organizations, but nothing important, um, nothing seems important anymore, but getting to know the Lord was important, getting to know uh, what's His purpose for my life now was important. I mean, before I was just running around, but when you know that you know, something that drastic happened, and especially if it's you or your spouse, um, you start thinking, thinking, you know, what's the purpose of my life? What's, you know, why am I here? And all the other things are just kind of, you know, not so important. And, of course, um, we know that Job, he lost everything, and he had all these questions, and he just, and the Bible tells us he's a righteous man. He was a good man who hated evil, and he loved God. And, but all these things happened, but he didn't have our perspective because we know there was a heavenly scene, and there's this deal that Satan was doing with God's permission, and he didn't know any of this. And so his friends came to, in the beginning, was to um, mourn with him, to comfort him. But then, um, you know, they sat down uh, with him and because they were shocked at the way he looked. And he was blisters. I mean, he lost his family, 10 children. He lost all his wealth, and his health was taken away from him uh, worse than I believe, than any human being besides the Lord Jesus when he was crucified. 
but blisters everywhere, sores everywhere. And I remember his wife told him to, hey, why are you still, you know, holding on to your righteousness, you know, clinging to God? Curse God and die. That's what his wife told him to do. And these friends came to, you know, to, uh, they were shocked when they saw him to comfort him. But then seven days later, they're sitting there with him. But then Job started talking and, and he was wondering, you know, why is this happening? And, and, and he was coming up with uh, his reasons. And he, Job didn't, you know, he believed he didn't do anything wrong. And then his friend, the first friend, which was pro probably the oldest friend, um, the one that's eldest, and he said, Eliphaz, he said, you know, there must be some sin in your life, right? And then, and then Job answered him, and, you know, Job just wondering what's going on, and he said, maybe I shouldn't even been born. And, you know, all those questions come when you, lo you lose everything, especially your health. So, but these guys, um, these guys thought they were helping. But you know, you can only help a friend if you know what they're going through. But, you know, just like if you're going to help someone who is um, having kids' issues, how to relate to teenagers, and you never had kids of your own, um, you don't know how to help that person. And so they're, his friends actually, you know, they thought they know, and they are using a lot of human wisdom peppered in with um, godly wisdom. So there's a combination there, but they really don't know because they don't have our, they did not have our perspective of ha having God's word about that heavenly scene, right? So they're giving Job all sorts of advices. Some are good and some are just because they don't understand and they just assumed and so for you and me, you know, we have to be careful when we give advice to someone because if we've never been in their shoes, going through what they've been going through, um, like a divorce or a loss of a baby or a loss of a spouse um, if you, or miscarriage, if you've never been through that, it's really hard to understand, um, to trying to understand what the other party's going through. Um, Paul, um, actually, he, uh, he, he said it in, I believe, in 1 Corinthians, uh, 2 Corinthians, I believe. Let me check. He said it somewhere here. 2 Corinthians, it's um, uh, verse 3. Blessed be God, the fa God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulations, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with comfort which, with which we ourselves are comforted by God. So what Paul was saying that, you know, we go through tribulations in life. Christians do go through tribulations. Jesus says, in this world you'll have tribulations. So don't believe those prosperity gospel where they say, hey, uh, if you trust the Lord, you're going to be rich, you're going to be wealthy, you're going to be healthy, and all that stuff. Um, Christians go through tribulation. Uh, and you and I should know that. It's a fact, especially when Jesus said that. But we live it. But during our tribulation, what God does is He promises that we would, He would guide us through. And here, he comforts us. When we have the Lord Jesus in our heart, when we're walking with the Lord, He comforts us, give us that peace. And once we experience that, went through that, we're able to help others who's going through the same thing. That's what Paul uh, was saying. But these guys really didn't have that. And because, in fact, Elihaz said, um, you know, you must have really bad sin, hidden sin, and all that. That's why you're going through this. And now, the second friend, um, Bildad, so chapter 8, verse 1, long intro. Then Bildad the Shuhite answered and said, How long will you speak these things? 
and the words of which your mouth be like a strong wind. So he's taking what Job told his first friend, Eliphaz, um, that, hey, you're not giving good advice. You're like a windbag. And he's using uh, Bildad, the second friend, is using kind of Job's word to say that, hey, how long can you keep saying these things? Um, your words are, uh, you're like a windbag too. And he said, does God subvert judgment? Or does the Almighty pervert justice? What does that mean? Uh, Bildad saying, isn't God fair? Isn't God about justice? And yes, God is fair. God is 100% about justice. He, he, you know, he's 100%, he does 100% the right thing. And it's like, but the thing is, Satan is always trying to question is always trying to question um, God's motive, and he uses those questions to get to us. If you think about it, um, when, uh, let's see, Adam and Eve, and with Eve, God told both Adam and Eve that, hey, you can enjoy the Garden of Eden, eat anything here, and any uh, the fruit from any trees, and except for the one in the middle. It's probably the most beautiful one with the prettiest fruit. You know, everybody thinks an apple, um, but doesn't really say. But it must be the most prettiest because if it's not the most prettiest, why would anybody want to go eat it? So he said, you can't have that one because if you do it, you'll certainly die spiritually dead. You're um, cut off. You're, the relationship with God is cut off. So, what does Satan do? Satan would say, hey, uh, did, uh, didn't God say you can eat anything here? And um, Eve said, yeah, everything except for the one in the middle. Because he, God said, you know, if we eat it, we're going to die. And Satan said, oh, that's not fair. You know, that, you, know you can eat it. You're not going to die. You're, you know, you're going to be as wise as God. In fact, if you think about a Lucifer, Satan, Lucifer was an archangel, but he wanted to be just like God. So he rebelled against God. And then becoming Satan, here he's using the same tactic. He said, hey, you can be just like God. You're not going to die. God, you know, the reason he doesn't want you to, to eat it is he doesn't want you to enjoy life. He's um, taking something away from you. But the truth of the fact is when God has certain parameters of life, it's to protect us. It's to help us to live life uh, on in glor abiding in Him, glorifying Him. But if we go to off that track, if we decide to say, hey, I want to do my thing, I want to eat the fruit. I want to do this and not this. God didn't create robots. He created people who can choose because love demands choice. If love, there's no choice in love, then we're robots. And that's not love. Um, you know, forced love is never love. So if we do this, he'll let us. But go that way, go that way, away from God's will, it's going to trap us. And it's a slippery slope into sin. And we become Satan's prisoners and trapped in sin. And it gets worse and the cycle keeps going. God has certain, his word tells us what to do in life and is to protect us. And so that's, um. so Satan is always asking, you know, is it fair? fear? Is it do? Uh, and then he did the same thing. And this guy is saying, hey, does God suburb judgment? Isn't God fair? Isn't God about justice? So he's saying truthful things, but assuming that, um, that, uh, that Job was doing something wrong. 
Then um, verse 4, if your sons have sinned against him, he cast them away for their transgressions. Uh, and then he's just being, basically saying that your sons, and you remember Job's kids, all 10 of them, died when they're having a meal and the, a wind just blew out the house and destroyed all, everybody inside. He's just suggesting, um, hinting that your sons, your kids probably had some secret sin. This guy, you know, I can't blame him because we humans, we kind of think like that, that, you know, there must be um, something that's wrong, that um, that's, why, uh, that's why bad things happen. And then um, verse uh, 5, if you would earnestly seek God and make your supplications to the Almighty, if you're pure and upright, uh, if you're pure, surely now he would awake for you. And he's saying that, you know, if you're doing the right thing, if you're seeking God, then God will, you know, this wouldn't be happening to you. You know, the, the, the thing about this is that these guys, we always assume that if we do the right thing, nothing bad will happen. And that's not true because bad things happen to Christians too. So we can't just say that, hey, because um, this thing's happening to you is because you dis disobeyed that. Of course, there are sins. All sins have consequences. Um, if you sleep around, you probably get a sexual tr sexually transmitted disease. Um, uh, if you, you know, steal, uh, if you and get caught, then you're going to be put into jail. I mean, there's just consequences. If you get bitter about certain things, and and um, then there's no joy. So there's certain consequences. But there are people who are doing the right thing, just like Job. But bad things happen. Um, yeah, you hear about you know Christian camps that had a drowning. Um, you know, bad things happen in life. So uh, even for good people. So here in verse, um, let's see. If you would verse five, if you would seek earnestly, if you would earnestly seek God and make your supplication to the Almighty. If you're right, pure, and upright, surely now he would awake for you. And this awake here doesn't mean that God's asleep because in, um, I think it's in Psalm, uh, Psalm 121, 4, um, God neither sleeps nor slumber. Uh, the word awake here is actually, um, uh, what's the word? Anthropomorphism. Anthropomorphism. It's um. It's a word that we learn in um, seminary that that describes trying to describe God's actions using human words, and human words are limited. And trying to describe what God can do, who is infinite, with finite words, and this is the only word that um, that can be used or to kind of describe what uh, God's doing. In the Psalms, um, sometimes you, you see David said, Awake, God, O Lord, awake. The, the reason is that, you know, there are times that maybe we're um, praying about something and nothing is happening. And, said, and we're, we're wondering, how come nothing's happening? I'm praying about this. And, and, and so that was the reason he said, Awake is a anthropomorphism. said, Lord, I desperately need you. You know, awake, you know, come help me. And that's the reason. Verse 7, and, and then, um, though your beginnings was small, yet your latter end would increase. Um, abundantly, that is. I was looking at another verse here. Verse 8, for inquire, please, of the former age, and consider the things discovered by their fathers. Um, here is, look at your history, because 
you know, some, you know, sometimes if you can look at history to see how, you know, people did things and, and um, how they, uh, looking at the former age and, and discovered by their fathers, this was probably, um, you know, shortly after the flood. After the flood, people lived around around 100 plus years. Prior to the flood, they lived, you know, 800. Um, Methuselah, the oldest person in the Bible, is 967 years. So they have a lot of knowledge, a lot of life experience. And after the flood is probably, what, one-eighth of pre-flood experience. Uh, verse 9, for we were born yesterday and know nothing, but our days on earth are a shadow. Will they not teach you and tell you and utter words from their heart? And then, can papayas grow up without a marsh? A uh, papayas uh, is the, the paper, or, you know, the writing, um, that, that scroll that they use, and they, they, they actually grow them along the Nile banks, and it's in marsh, which is like with like mud and, and uh, muddy areas. And then, um, can the reeds flourish without water? While it is yet green and is not cut down, it withers before any other plants. And then, you know, it's, you know, Job, um, you need to have that good relationship with God. And because if you don't have that good relationship with God, you're going to be cut down. It's going to wither. So about that is assuming that Job does not have a good relationship with God, which not a, not a correct assumption. We know that Job was a good man. Um, verse uh, 13, so, so are the path of all who forget God and the hope of the hypocrites shall perish. So now, Bildad is accusing Job of being a hypocrite. I mean, think about this. You lost everything. You lost your family. You lost your health all your wealth, you're hurting, and these guys are supposed to come and comfort you? I mean, what kind of friend is it that say, you have secret sin, you must be hiding something? No, you're a hypocrite. Wow. I mean, that's pretty tough. Verse 14, what confidence shall be cut off? And whose trust is a spider's web? You know, spiders, you know, they have all the intricate spider webs, but for people, they're, they're not that strong. You can just grab it and, and, and they, they, they tear apart. So whose trust is spider web? He leans on his house, but it does not stand. He holds it fast, but it does not, does not endure. He grows green in the sun, and he, his branches spread out in his garden. His roots wrap around the rock heap and look for a place in the stones. And then um, verse 18, if he destroys, uh, if he is destroyed from his place, then you will deny him, saying, I have not seen you. You know, he's telling Job that you can't trust in vain things. You know, because if you start, start trusting in vain hopes, in, 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 uh, in all these other things, you know, the Lord is not going to remember you. You will be forgotten. So he's, this friend was really laying it on on Job. Behold, this is the joy of his way, and out of the earth other will grow. Behold, God will not cast away the blameless, nor will he uphold, uphold the evildoer. He said, Job, you say you are you know, you haven't, you haven't done anything wrong. And if you haven't done anything wrong, God will not cast you away, but he already did it. That means you are in the wrong. I mean, that's use, using human logic, right? We always think that when something bad happened to someone, that means they must have done something wrong. We got to be very careful about that. You know, God is very patient. 
God does not want anyone to perish. And just because something bad happens, and it could be that they, you know, they stole, embezzled money, they're going to jail. Yes. But again, we don't know the whole story. And, and just because somebody, you know, died in a plane crash doesn't mean that they did something wrong. Um, verse 20, he will yet fulfill your mouth with laughing and your lips with rejoicing. So what he's saying that, hey, come back to the Lord. If you come back to the Lord, do what God wants you to do, you're going to be rejoicing with laughing. Those who hate you will be clothed with shame, and the dwelling place of the wicked shall, be, shall come to nothing. Hey, everything will turn out. Just come back to the Lord. But here's Job. He didn't do anything wrong. And he's suffering. He's suffering for something that, you know, that was decided in the heaven in heaven with uh, when the Lord was talking uh, to Satan, when Satan came to give a report, it just, um, it's, you know, you feel for Job because he's trying to figure out life. All right, I got to get going. Then Job answered and said, truly, I know it so. He said, hey, being right with God is true. It's always good to be right with God means that we actually, you know, have complete trust in our God. We have complete commitment in our God. But being right with God, as I said earlier, doesn't mean you're going to be problem-free. You know, it's not true that God, you know, if you're doing right, that you're going to be super blessed. I know people who turn to the Lord and being right with God and that everything just turned upside down. Um, and, and, and nothing, I mean, things were worse because he's, this person is right with God. A lot of his friends left. Family said, no, you cannot be Christian. Being right with God doesn't mean everything will go right. But we need to know that when God allows trials to happen, when God allows bad things to happen, and you didn't do anything wrong, but he's allowing it, what that means is God has a purpose for it. There's a lesson to be learned. Even though you don't believe you did anything wrong and and don't believe you deserve this, but God allowed it. And if God allowed it, there must be a purpose for it. And we need to, to, to even move toward God and, and, and just, just ask Him that, Lord, help me to be committed to You because we know, I know, and You know that when God allows something, that he has his plans, and that we need to commit our lives to the Lord and do what he wants us to do. And then um, we let the Lord know that, Lord, my life is yours. You do what you want with my life, even though I don't understand why certain things are going on. And, you know, it's not easy being in the midst of it. Because you want to do things that are pleasing to God and you want to have that joyful experience. But life, sometimes it's not like that. But the one good thing is we can trust that God knows what's going on. And because He has a purpose, He has a plan, we can rest in Him. We can say, Lord, I don't know where you're taking me and where this ride is going but I'm trusting in you. So, he said, truly I know it so, but how can a man, a, how can a man, man be righteous before God if one wish to contend with him, if he one wish to, to plead with him? And so what he's using, what Job is saying is that, hey, how can a uh, man be just 
before God, be righteous before God. And how can we ask, question, plead? He could not answer him one time out of a thousand. So if we're trying to plead, let's just say in a courtroom, we're trying to make our case, and with God and God cross examines us, asks us questions, he could not answer him one time out of a thousand. What that means is that, you know, God knows everything. And we try to plead, we cannot answer even one question, one time out of a thousand questions. God, verse 4, God is wise in heart and mighty in strength, who has pardoned himself against him and prospered. You know, who has hardened himself. It's never good to harden our hearts against God. If God is telling us what to do, if we're hardening our heart, well, it's a losing proposition because God always wins. And not just that, um, I see it's Isaiah 45, 9. Let me try to find it. Isaiah 45, 9, I think I have it here. It says, Woe to him who strives with his maker, and then let the posture strive with the posture of the earth. Shall the clay say to him who forms it, What are you making? What shall your handiwork say? He has no hands. You know, it's like saying, it's the first um, part, Woe to him who strives with his maker. It's not good to strive against God, to, to fight against God. Can a pot, a clay pot, can clay tell the potter what to do? I mean, the potter has all the power. And God has is sovereign. He is omnipotent. And it's not a good thing to to fight against him, to harden our heart. And the issue with life is this. When we're in sin, and sin could be, you know, it doesn't have to be like, you know, sexual sin or alcoholism. It could be the sin of pride. It could be the sin um, of power. Uh, and when we keep hardening our heart and not looking at things from God's perspective about you know, about the spirit, about relationships, about spiritual relationships. You know, in church we have, um, you know, the different types of fellowships, the men's fellowship, the women's fellowship, the married couple fellowship, the youth fellowship. Um, yeah, there's di different Bible studies and all that. But we're just thinking about, you know, power, about, you know, different you know, influences and all that, you know, we're not looking at the spiritual aspects of it. And then we keep hardening our hearts, um, having unforgiveness, having bitterness, and, 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 and do things unwisely. We're hardening our heart. And the, the issue is this. We may think, we, you can harden your heart so hard and make all sorts of decisions and think that I won, I won. You know, they lost. But when one does that knowingly against the leading of the Holy Spirit, against the Lord's Word, then you actually lost big time. Who has hardened himself against him, against him and prospered? Rhetorical question, no one. He removes the mountain, and now he's talking about God's power, and they do not know. He can, when he overturns them in his anger, he shakes the earth out of his place, earthquakes, and his pillar tremble. He commands the sun, and it does not rise. He seals off the stairs. Um, God can do that when Joshua was fighting. He alone spreads out the heavens and treads on the waves of the sea. He made the bear Orion and the uh, Pleiades in the chamber of the south. He does great things past finding out, yet wonders without numbers. If he goes by me, I do not see him. If he moves fast, 
I do not foresee him. Job is saying that, hey, I can only see the results of God's work, but God is invisible. I can't see him. And actually, he's spirit. If he takes away, verse 12, who can hinder him? Who can say to him, what are you doing? God will not withdraw his anger. The allies of the proud lie prostrate from him, believe him. Again, the clay pot cannot say to the potter, hey, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? God is sovereign, but God is also love. So having these two together, it should, it should comfort us. God knows what to do. He's sovereign and he is love. How then can I answer him, verse 14, and choose my words to reason with him? For though I, for though I were righteous, I cannot answer him. I would beg mercy of my judge. You know, even if you can talk to the Lord, Job was saying, and, and, and back then, you know, Jesus hasn't come yet to die on the cross, so he has no direct access. But God does speak um, through his spirit. How can I talk to the Lord? How can I answer him? And, you know, and, and what he's saying is, for though I were righteous, I cannot answer him. Even though I know I really didn't do anything, I can't say anything. He's sovereign. He's all-powerful. He's almighty. He said, I would just beg for mercy. And if you think about it in the New Testament, we read that. There was a publican who went to the temple, and, and he just keep beating up his chest. And he said, be merciful to me, O Lord, a sinner. And then, the, and then there was these um, respected people, the Pharisee, who prayed prayers, said, hey, I thank God I'm not like that guy. I'm not like that guy. He had this uppity attitude, and, you know, I, I give 10% I give uh, to the Lord. And, and the Lord Jesus just said that, you know, that first guy, that, that guy who just beat his chest and just say, and would even dare to look up, said, be merciful to me, a sinner. That guy is going home justified, but not the other guy. And Job once said, I'm going to be like that first guy. I'm going to beg for mercy. Verse 16, if I called and he answered me, I would not believe that he was listening to my voice. For he crushes me with a tempest and multiples, multiplies my wounds without cause. Job must have been getting, you know, he was in the, I believe he was in the worst state, but here it may it, it may hint that he's getting even worse. I can't even imagine that. That's a um, poor guy. Uh, verse 18, he will not allow me to catch my breath, but fills me with bitterness. It is a matter of strength. Indeed, he is strong. But if of justice, who will appoint my day in court? And so Job was just saying, yeah, you know, I just don't get it. I don't get why I'm... I'm I'm, I'm having this, having all these things happen. And who's going to appoint a day for me in court? How can I even talk to, to God? Verse 20, though I were righteous, my own mouth would condemn me. Though I were blameless, it would prove me perverse. I am blameless, yet I do not know myself. I despise my life. He said, you know, as far as I know, I didn't do anything. I, I was just living life. I was um, loving God. I loved my kids. I was a good husband, a uh, good businessman. And I was, uh, you know, I sacrificed for my kids when they don't sacrifice. And I, 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 I hate evil but love the Lord. And he's wondering, you know, why is this, all these things happening? And I just don't understand. Verse 22, is it all one thing, therefore I say, he destroys the blameless and the wicked? If the scourge slays suddenly, he laughs at the plight of the innocent. The earth is given into the hand of the wicked. He covers the face of, it, of his judges. If it is not he, who else could it be? He's saying that 
the world is getting worse and worse with even wicked judges. And he's wondering, you know, how can he, how can he talk to the Lord? How can he um, plead his case? But if he gets a chance to plead his case, he's going to beg for mercy. Um, verse 25, now my days are swifter than a runner. A runner is a messenger in those days. And he said, hey, my life is going faster. And he's thinking he's probably going to die um, than a runner. They flee away. They see no good. Verse 26, they pass like a swift, swift ships, like an eagle swooping on his prey. If I say I will not forget my complaint, I will put off my sad face and wear a smile. I am afraid of all my suffering. I know that you will not hold me innocent. If I am condemned, why then do I labor in pain? If I wash myself with snow water and cleanse my hands with soap, yet you will plunge me into the pit, and my own clothes will abhor me. Then goes 32, For he is not a man as I am, that I may answer him. You know, we don't deal God as man deals with man. God is God. He is not man. He is omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent. He is sovereign, but he is also love. And then, so he said again, verse 32, For he is not a man as I am, that I may answer him, and that we should go to court together. You don't go to court with the Lord. And then he said, verse 33, Nor is there any mediator between us who may lay his hand on us both. So this is the dilemma with Job. He knows God is all-powerful. He knows God is sovereign. You know, God is holy. He knows that, and he knows how weak he is, especially now. I mean, he's got nothing. And he's just sitting there looking very pathetic. His wife told him to die, curse God and die. And his friends here, quote-unquote friends, called him hypocrite. Uh, you must have secret sins. Your children have secret sins. Uh, there's something, you did something wrong. Repent, come back to God. He's wondering all this. He's saying that there must, I need a, uh, nor is there any mediator between us who may lay hands on us both. So what he's asking is, God is up there. I'm down here. There's no way to talk to him, to reach him, unless I have someone in the middle, a mediator who can touch us both. Who is that? You know, this is actually a prophetic word from Job. And we read in Philippians, let me find there. Let me go over there. Uh, Philippians. Gentiles eat pork chops. Here it is. Philippians 2. And I'm going to read um, verse 5 on. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, Jesus is God, did not consider it robbery, to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in the appearance of men, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. You know, and let me turn to John. Um, John 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus was the Word in the beginning, and then the Word was with God, the Word was God, and verse 14, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us and beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. You know, Job was asking for a mediator, a mediator that can touch both God and him and man. And that is Jesus Christ. He came from heaven, God, Son of God, to become human flesh. So to die on the cross, so he can be that bridge 
he, all who believes in him, will, ex, all who accepts him, he takes our sins and nails it to the cross, gives us his righteousness. And not only that, he gives us his Holy Spirit to dwell with us. That is this mediator who can lay his hand on God the Father and man. And it's a beautiful um, story. It's a beautiful um, pro prophetic word from Job, and he knew it. He knew he needed a mediator. Verse 34, let him take his rod away from me, and do not let dread of him terrify me, that I would speak and not fear him, but it is not so with me. Then chapter 10. So Job finished talking with Bildad. Now he's turning to God and kind of complaining to God. My soul loathe my life. I will give free course to my complaint. I will speak in bitterness out of my soul. I will say to God, do not condemn me. Show me why you contend with me. You know, oh, Lord, what did I do? What I, can you let me know why this is happening to me? <sighs> you know, there are certain times that we just don't understand. We don't get it. And, I mean, it happens to me. I just don't get why certain things are happening in life. And, and uh, you know, I ask the Lord, and, and we're, we're trying to understand. And, and sometimes, it, at those times, we really need to fall back on what we do understand from God. We know that He loves us. We know that He has a purpose for us. And we know that God causes all things together for good for those who are called according to His purpose, according to His plan. And we know that these things, for sure, that He loves us. He has a plan for us, and everything's going to work together for good for those who are His. We claim on to that. And then said, Lord, I, I don't know what's this, why this is going on, and, but I'm going to trust you. I'm going to lean on you, and I'm just going to go with you. I want to have my heart so soft that, that wherever you lead, that's where I want to go. So you may be in a situation that you're going like, you know, um, I will speak in bitterness of my soul. I will say to God, do not condemn me. Show me why you contend with me. Why are you doing this, Lord? You know, we know Job was a good guy. He loved God and hated evil. But God still allowed this to happen to him. So we stick with the Lord. And this is where faith comes in. I mean, it's easy to love God and, you know, sing and play the guitar and be happy and, you know, and, and, and take people to dinner and all that. Um, when everything's going well, easy. But when things are not going well, are you still going to have faith in the Lord? Or are you going to give everybody the laser eyes, you know, how to do and, and, and all that? We need to just love the Lord and say, Lord, guide us through this. Guide us through the valley of shadow of death. And again, if you know me, the key word here is through the valley of shadow of death. So Job was in that funk, right? He's trying to figure life out. And, and verse 3, does it seem good to you that you should oppress, does, that you should despise the work of your hands? You know, and smile on the counsel of the wicked. You know, are you pleased with where I am now? That's what he's talking to the Lord about. Do you have eyes of flesh? What do you see as man sees? Are you seeing this, Lord? Uh, are your days like the days of mortal man and your years like the uh, days of mighty man that you, just, that you should seek for my iniquity and search out my sin? You know, is there something that's going on in me that, 
I need to know about, Lord. And like I said, we have that heavenly perspective. The guy didn't do anything wrong, but this was happening to him. Although you know that I am not wicked and that there is no one who can deliver from your hand. You know, he knows that he, um, he knows his heart, but he also knows that God is sovereign. He's just trying to figure out why, um, why he's in this state. Verse 8, your hands have made me and fashioned me in an intricate unity. You know, he knows Psalms. And this is before Psalms. And that's why God's word, so let me just take that back. Probably David knows Job. But you know, both are God's word, God's inspired word. Um, but you and I are fearfully and wonderfully made, intricately made. We are God's um, poema, uh, poem. We're unique, uniquely made. And, and, and He, God loves you, God loves me, because you and I are unique. And God has a purpose and I love the fact that your hands have made and fashioned me an intricate unity. Everything fits. Everything fits. And, and, that's the, um, and that's the image of a church, too. Everything should fit. It should be one, you know, from God's perspective as one body. And, uh, but... If you have different perspectives, it makes it hard. But it should be from the Lord's perspective and how He wants you and me to work individually and then work corporately. Okay, let's go. Um, Your hands have made me and fashioned me an intricate unity, yet you would destroy me. Remember, I pray, that you have made me like clay. You know, we are dust, right? And then, and you turn me, and will you turn me into dust again? Yes, I just went ahead of myself. Um, Job was thinking that, am I just going to go to, uh, just die from, um, from this situation? You know, he doesn't have our perspective because we could see the end. God has a wonderful, in fact, his best days are ahead. I mean, he had wonderful days before. He was probably one of the richest guys in the world. Lost everything because God allowed Satan to take it all. And now he's probably the worst situation in that time period. But God has something around the corner in the last chapter. He doesn't see it yet. But it may be that God has something for you around that corner. You, do, you and I do not see it yet. And so... That's why we abide in Jesus, walk with the Lord. Okay, let's get going. Um, verse 9, remember, I pray that you have made me like clay and will you turn me into dust again? Did you not pour me out like milk and curdle me like cheese? You know, this is um, interesting. Uh, curdle me like cheese is like, you know, the, a, a shape of a baby in the womb. And, you know, it's like curled. And I'm going, it's, the meaning here is seed um, planted into a womb. But they don't have, back then, we're talking about, you know, maybe Abraham's time frame. They don't have MRIs and ultrasounds. But, you know, God's word is, is amazing. It's, um, he knew. Verse 11. Close me with skin and flesh and knit me together with bones and sinew. You have granted me life and favor, and your care has preserved my spirit. Verse 13, and these things you have hidden in your heart. I know that this was with you. If I sin, then you mark me, and you will not acquit me of my iniquity. If I am wicked, woe to me. Even if I'm righteous, I cannot lift my head. I am full of uh, I am full of disgrace. See my misery. He's just saying that, man, Lord, I don't 
understand why I am in this situation. And he, um, and he's just trying to figure out, you know, how can I, how can I get it, right? And then if my head, verse 6, is exalted, you hunt me like a fierce lion. You again show, your mer- show yourself awesome against, against me. Um, how do I say this? I'm trying to figure. In life, we're not going to figure out everything. I guess that's the best way I can say it. I remember uh, uh, when the worst thing that happened to me up to now, um, when my first wife passed away, I remember just, I mean, almost 30 years, right? And I remember just saying, Lord, why? I don't get it. But I didn't get it for a long time. But it was years later that I finally got it, that he has a big picture. And, 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 and he promised me that I have a plan. It was years, years later that picture became clear. You know, but there are times that we're not going to get it, especially in that moment. But in that moment, as I've been saying, that we just need to rush to the Lord and completely trust Him, be committed to Him, knowing that He knows and He understands. Verse 17, you renew your witnesses against me and increase your indignation toward me. Changes in war are ever with me. Why then have you brought me out of the womb? He's, he's again saying that. Why did you let me be born, right? Oh, that I had perished and no eye had seen me. I would have been as though I had not been you know, I, I, I should have been stillborn. I should have been dead. I, I would have been carried from the womb to the grave. You know, he's in a very bad shape. I mean, losing everything and his health like that, and it's getting worse, and it already worse. Now getting even worse. He said, I, I wish I just, I'm just dead, right? Why am I even born? And he's complaining to the Lord. Verse 20, are not my days few? Cease, leave me alone that I may take little comfort. Hey, you know, he's telling you know, the Lord, his friend said, hey, you know, my last few days, just, just leave me alone. Um, before, uh, verse 20, before I go to the place from which I shall not return, to the land of darkness and a shadow of death, a land as dark as darkness itself, and a shadow of death without any order, where even the light is like darkness. <sighs> I feel for Job. But there's a little bit of comfort in reading all this because I know the end, and you know the end, because even in our worst days, even when you, we, you and I are facing difficult trials, it's not like this. It's not like this. And God pulled him through. So for you and me, we can rejoice even in tribulation because God does have a plan. We may be going through this so we can help other people later who's going to go through this because you're going to have that experience. We don't know, but God does. So we trust. We trust in Him. We hang on to Him, but we love because God is love. You know, we just continue to love even people you don't like. You love them using God's love. How do you do that? You spend time with the Lord. You spend time reading His Word. Let God pour His love onto you, and His love is unlimited because me, I only have a little bit of love. Give me five minutes, it's gone. But when I read God's Word and abide in Him and just spend time with Him, He's pouring tons of love, and then we can just pour out love to others. We'll start again next um, Wednesday, Lord willing, and it's gonna, the third guy is going to talk now to Job. <sighs> they don't know what Job's going through, but he's going to say his two cents worth. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for this time. Lord, I just pray that you be with each one 
who's hearing your word, and whatever situation each one is in, let them know that you're there, that we only see the now, but you see the future. You know what's around the corner. Help each one, help me and all of us to just trust you and be guided by you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thanks for joining me. God bless.